Hey sinners, you're listening to Sinful Cuts, the podcast that takes a look at the wild, weird, and wonderful world of horror. We take a deep dive into some of your favorite movies, possibly uncover some hidden gems. Sometimes we even get some stinkers. Thank you so much for joining us. We truly love having you here. Please sit back. Take a listen, and let's get our scare on. (laughs) Hey, sinners, how you doing? Welcome to another episode of Simple Cuts. I am Sean. I'm Shannon. And today we are so lucky. I'm I'm so incredibly excited because Emily, I don't I don't know if you've been listening to our shortcuts episodes, but I steal from you, almost to the point where you may have a lawsuit. (laughs) (laughs) And you may have rights. Well, I wasn't going to say anything. You may you may have rights now to a couple of songs that Sean has made uh, over the course of of the episodes as they've progressed. I'm actually going to need uh, f- files of those so I can use them for promotional purposes and we'll call it even. How about that? Deal. I just want you to know my singles are trending in Thailand and of the $13 that I've made, you can have halfsies. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you got to send it in pennies though. How about that? Exactly. Penny at a time. Keep you on the hook. So sinners, we have got none other than Emily Hughes. Uh, you, you, you listen every week. I crib all of the great uh, horror literature recommendations from Read Jump Scares. Emily, you are a personal hero of mine. That's not just I'm not just blowing smoke. Uh, what you do for the horror community, for horror authors, well known and independent, especially the independent, you know, the smaller authors that really need everything, all the exposure that they can get. You are like this lighthouse, like the shining light that lets people know, go here. This is what you want to read. This is good stuff. And then by proxy, that leads to people hopefully reaching out to um, their local bookstore and getting the books through them. So, you know, it's the, the circle of literature life and you you are you're a humongous part of that so i really really appreciate it but hold on i've got to read some of your accolades here okay (laughs) so oh god (laughs) we have emily was the former editor of uh unbound worlds and tour nightfire.com uh you can find emily's writings in none other than the new york times hello vulture tour.com electric literature and thrillist um of course your website that i steal from uh, on a weekly basis rejumpscares.com is it's it's the one-stop shop for not only horror literature i mean you've got you've got different genres of literature in there but if you happen to be into horror your 2024 horror list and shannon and i've been joking about this for months now when that comes out i get dizzy i literally get dizzy (laughs) you You and me both (laughs) i tell people i'm like does nobody talk to me for six to eight hours i've got digging to do and then i get you know i make my list but what i love about it the most is i make my list of stuff that that readily jumps out but then as the weeks go by cuz you you know you're curating this list uh, on a weekly basis i'm assuming because stuff pops up there and you're you know you're pointing everybody in in uh, all these in- interesting and great directions and in my mind i'm like oh this is going to cost me so much money as the list gets bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> it's it's money that's, that's my ultimate aim i just want to bankrupt everybody <laughs> It's money well spent. I, so many horror books. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of speaking of horror books, why don't we talk about one in particular? Because we have Horror for Weenies coming out in September from Quirk. And this book is for – hold on. No, let me just read the logline. Everything you need to know about the films you're too scared to watch. I mean, what more do I have to say? I love that. Absolutely <laughs> love it. Well, thank you. I'm so excited about it. Um, it feels insane that it's happening. I I watch a lot of movies, obviously, with uh, usually with my husband, and he's obviously got a very high tolerance for me pausing the movie and going and the symbolism and the, oh my god, the way he's framed this and you know just like whatever thing that I'm remarking on at the at the moment. And now 
I get to scream that at everybody who reads the book and not just at my <laughs> husband. So uh, you're all really doing me and him a big favor. Well, I can't. September can't come soon enough. I cannot wait for this book. I know. Uh, Thank you so much. We have some exciting news. As we get closer to publication, we're going to have you back. I don't want to spoil it. I'm not going to do any spoilers, but we're going to have you back. We're going to talk about more movies that, you know, are kind of in the same vein of of, uh, what we're doing today and then what we're going to talk about in September. So just can't get enough of you. You can come back every week if you want. <laughs> you guys are great. This is honest. I would love to. This is a delight. Yeah, we like to we like to have a good time with it. So today we're talking about two movies that are folk horror gold. We've got The Wicker Man and we've got Midsommar. So the first question that we always pose to our guests, because we send you the list and it's got about like 30, about 25, 35 movies on it. What made you choose folk horror and these movies in particular? Folk horror is uh, a a special favorite of mine in terms of horror subgenres. I I think it come it all kind of goes back to being um, a kid who would read like Dallaire's book of Greek myths, um, things like that. Just like we had all these books, uh, kids books about different cultures and you know science and and stuff like that. And I was always so fascinated by like you know, the weird little folk rights you'd find out about in those books, the things that they kind of sprinkle through like, oh, in this culture, you know, the uh, death ceremony is like this, or this is what they do to celebrate a birth. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. You know, even as a kid, the way different communities do different things. And then as I got older and got more into horror, it was sort of like, oh, there's a whole corner of the genre for for me, for my weird (laughs) interests. Um, And I love that. I, I, I love the way folk horror pulls its power from the idea that like everybody knows something, but, or, but you, you're the only one on the outside yeah. and everyone else knows like the secrets. Um, and that's such, I think that's such a pervasive source of fear for people. That's, you know, uh, it, the idea that everyone's talking about you or you've been, you've been excluded. I mean, that's something that we all kind of feel right. You know, it dates back to middle school yeah, or earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, Almost on a daily basis. Never really goes away. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very much like oh, so sorry, and I, go ahead. <laughs> Oh no, no. Um The Wicker Man is is one of the entries in the book. Um so I of course was jumping at uh the chance to talk about this movie and Midsummer is not in the book but Hereditary is. Um I'm a big Ari Aster fan. Uh but Midsummer the only reason I went for Hereditary over Midsummer in the book is uh it's it's just more influential i think it's more of a okay this is a you know the an, you know the arrival of a big new voice in horror that's obviously had like a, a super long tail um but i do love midsummer i think it's my favorite of his movies and i couldn't resist the chance to talk about it love it i love absolutely it. love it I'll- I want to. I've got a question. Before we get it, we'll start with Wicker Man. I mean, we'll talk about the two movies because they're so intertwined mm-hmm. because they're so similar. As you know, <laughs> movies that are really about subterfuge and let's get some let's get some foolish people who think they know everything. Let's let's sucker them in, and then boy oh boy, does it go poorly for everyone involved. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I did. I did want to first start with. Um, well, let's. Introduce the Wicker Man. So, well, I think I wrote down the date. Wicker Man is seventy three, right? And one of the interesting things, just to talk about some of the, we call them the hard yards. Some of the things about the movie in general was that um, this was really a Christopher Lee project. He wanted to get this off mm-hmm. the ground. He took. He did not get paid for this movie. So, mm-hmm. you know, I I'm already madly in love with. Uh, Sir Christopher Lee. Um, but when I found that out, it made me love him that much more. And uh, we eventually got Edward Woodward as um, uh, Officer Howie, but he actually had offered the role to uh, Peter Cushing. And Peter Cushing couldn't take it because he had Ugh. scheduling commitments. But boy, oh boy, would that have been great. You know, I mean, I would have absolutely loved yes. that. So um, before we get, oh, Emily. I forgot to tell you, we have one more member of the team here who just walked in. 
We actually have two members. My dog Charlie <laughs> just yeah. announced himself. <laughs> Come on in. I've got I've got one oh. right here. One of my cats is asleep behind me. That's Cece. So we've got nice. a whole team. Yeah, we we like to bring our pets in, whether we want to or not. Yeah. Um, now you're trapped in here with me, Charlie. So. Um, <laughs> So, so I just wanted to point out that even though The Wicker Man, I think it has this um, this incredible reputation as like the – oh boy, like this is the folk horror. But I found out through the research that um, folk horror, the term actually came to be because uh, they were describing mm-hmm. um, blood on Satan's claw. And that really yeah. brought the, the term about. That – I absolutely was bowled over because I just assumed that people had been talking about full car for decades prior to that. I didn't know that it was a seventies convention that came to be. So, you know, Mm -hmm. horror nerds rejoice. The, the things about folk horror that, you know, the characteristics of folk horror obviously predated the term predated this movie, but, you know, going all the way back to like Arthur Machen stories, you know, from a century ago or, or more, um, that's me sort of obliquely revealing that I cannot remember dates to save my life. Um, so I don't know what year anything happened in ever. Um, but those conventions have been around for a really long time, those characteristics of the genre, the sort of like weird <clears throat> folk rights. Um, but yeah, it was. I think it's generally credited to Mark Gattis, who is a British... Um, director, writer, producer, actor. Uh, if you've seen BBC Sherlock from like the 2010s, he plays Sherlock's brother. How about his Dracula? Uh, um, yeah. Uh, he's, I have, I've mixed feelings about him, but that's a whole other podcast. But, <laughs> oh, okay. um, oh, you're going to have to tell us offline. But, All right. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, folk horror, it, the the sort of the unholy trinity uh, I think it's Adam Scoville is the writer who coined this uh, the unho- unholy trinity of folk horror, the Wicker Man, Blood on Satan's Claw, and Witchfinder General, which all came out right around this time period, mm. and it was this sort of sort of reaction to this like back to the land movement, you know, the sort of hippie like oh you know the cities are the cities are the source of everything that's bad in humanity, and we should all go back and be you know commune living uh hippies in the countryside and and then folk horror kind of investigates like well people are people no matter where they are you know if they're in the city or the country they're still going to get up to some janky yeah. shit <laughs> so i mean look at the look at the manson family you know i mean they thought they were they were right. hippies. They, they thought they were um giving back to the earth in some way they they would dumpster dive and get food that people were throwing away so they're like oh we're recycling you know like we're you know and they were just i don't know they definitely put themselves on a pedestal that they were a lot more righteous at a, um you know at at the time as opposed to um you know the, the working man or the you know um the yuppie scum if you will you know whatever the term was Right. We're, we're realer. We're more connected right, to the earth. Right, right, right. You know, and that gives us a sense of entitlement to murder people, <laughs> which is, right, which is, is a very, which is the very, the very premise of both of these films, which, you know, makes it interesting because it's like, it, it in a way it's, it's true that it's happened, even though these are our stories, um, you know, it's, it is, it has a sense of truth to it. Which is what I, th- which is where I really I think in either one is where the the terror really is because some people go there's conversations out there too where like is this are these horror films are they just more thrillers are they where to me the, I I absolutely see them as horror it's it's just very much disguised with with the the, um, the happiness and the brightness and the, the 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 beautiful bright colors and and you know everything looks like it could be a, a lifetime christmas movie um yeah. with a <laughs> very different ending <laughs> Yeah. You know, like a lifetime winter it's, solstice, and, and movie. that's yeah. what makes it. <laughs> yeah. And that, but that's what makes it, uh, at least to me, anyway, actually that much more terrifying. Um, the fact that it's completely in disguise, where these people both have um, an ultimate goal, 
to granted they have a higher service in, in their minds to give, but in in brass tax, it's murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah, it's very. It's, you murder. know, so it's that's what makes these films really, really interesting. Don't we all love though? I mean, <clears throat> going back to Grimm's fairy tales. I mean, just and Emily, to your point, just the folklore from just eons ago. I mean, you know, Sean O'Connor. It's it's, it's no um, you know, no secret that that I'm Irish. And we, my family used to go over because my mom's actually from Ireland. She came over at 19. We would go back um, and see her family every Easter. And even from a young age, you know, we would travel the countryside. We'd visit this family at a farm. We'd go here. We'd go to these little tiny towns. And people couldn't wait to tell you about the wee beasties and the ghosts and the ghouls and what this means over here. And don't go into that glen because you'll never come out again. And it was all very good natured and fun. And I took it that way. And it wasn't until I got older that I was like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> that was pretty dark <laughs> stuff and pretty terrifying. And then, of course, because of who I am and what I love, I was like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get back there and find out more about it. You know, everywhere you go, we went to um, my family. <laughs> we went to Greece two years ago. And even there, just on a vacation, and it's during the summer, and we're at the beach, and we're bouncing around. But even in those in the, that kind of setting, where you know it's just idyllic, you still bumped into folklore everywhere that you went, and I just love that stuff. So I like it when um, you know it, it, it. It's to your point, Shannon. You know, we have these stories that begin, and they're kind of innocent, and everything is good natured, and then slowly, not so much in Ari <laughs> Oster's case. I mean, it gets dialed up, you know, to eleven, and then to another eleven. But <laughs> you know, the Wicker Man. It, it starts out, you know, you're 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 put in um, Edward Woodward's shoes, and I mean, he's a kind of like a a, a you know windbag, kind of like a blustery ass, you know, and he, yeah. he's representing <laughs> the moral Christian center of England at the time, and you know, king and country, king yeah. and country, and conservative mm -hmm. values, whatever kind of conservative, big C, little C, whatever, however you want to label that, but it is conservative values, yes. and I'm going to come to a place I've never been before, and I'm going to tell you what you should be doing, and I'm going to tell you what the score is. And to watch him be manipulated, and what I, you know, what I truly love about folk horror, if is that after everyone gets their comeuppance, you really feel compelled to go back to the beginning again and rewatch it to see all those pitfalls mm -hmm. that the main character, really like a Grimm's fairy tale, the choices that they made or didn't make, and how that directly affects what happens to them. You know, my. And this is just my opinion, but for for me, I have to watch um, uh, uh, Midsommar three times, really four. Mm -hmm. The first time is to watch it and have that experience of what the hell is going on here. Then the second time is to watch it and still say what the hell is going on here, but look for the clues. Then the third mm -hmm. time – <laughs> is to watch it and say, what the hell is going on here? I think I have the clues, but you also, with that film in particular, there's the film in the foreground and then there's the film in the background because there's so much going on mm -hmm. in that movie in the background. I love that. Right? Yeah. I mean, it. I love it so much. The watch. There's really? just like, they're, they're staged, the whole movie is staged like a play like the whole village of harga is staged like a theatrical production and that's even nodded at in the dialogue right you know pella the the swedish guy who brings our hapless americans mm -hmm. over to this festival says you know oh you're 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 gonna think it's silly it's just a lot of pageantry but just think of it like theater and that's exactly how the production design yeah. is like laid out which i love and there's all this stuff going on in the background and i can only imagine the logistics that went into yeah, that the, you know? the artwork absolutely helps tell the story um which you don't realize at first to you they're just like what the mm -hmm. fuck am i looking at you know like but <laughs> but when i watched it a second time i'm like you know i realized like the whole like the um like the girl capturing a man's attention with uh you know baking the little you know with the, with, 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 <laughs> right she's trimming with this, some some special spices the, onto the it yeah. ingredient. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, there, there was that, um, you know, there's the bear and the fire. Um, there's, um, there's a yeah, lot of things I saw early on when Danny is, no, no, oh, no, I, I was, I was finished, but that's, yeah, there's a lot to see. Well, early on, Danny is under this like print. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. I hope I'm not talking That's over okay. you. No, not at all. All good. Um, early on, there's this scene where Danny Florence Pugh is lying, uh, you know, in, in her like horrible grief and depression under a painting of mm. a bear and a little blonde girl in a white dress with a flower crown and they're just sort of leaning their heads against each other and just throughout like he's got this great and i was an art history major full disclosure so i have a lot of feelings and fascinations about the use of illustrative art in in midsummer and he he really paid ari aster really paid like very close attention to his influences and like there is a folk tradition in sweden um i, th I think they're actually called halsing murals um, of passing folk information through these illustrations and paintings. And that's what he was drawing on really directly. Yeah. Um, but of course, you know, twisting it to make it as as horrifying as it is in the film. And I just love the way it's executed. It's so masterful. It and it it, it it you know, because I have trouble doing two things at once. <clears throat> and here <laughs> not only not only is Ari Hosner doing, you know, he's directing, but let's give credit. I mean, the crew that he that that he has on this film, these people, I mean, th th the, their ability and their craftsmanship, and it's all right there on the screen. But I just I wanted to bring up one scene because I just you know I rewatched it this morning. There's there's the one scene where you have uh, uh, Kristen and Josh and Mark, they come and they're talking to Pella as he's gardening. And it's a huge, I, I, I love the use of all the wide shots. I mean, he really has to do the wide shots in this movie because there's just so much going on. To your point, Emily, it's truly mm -hmm. like a play in front of your eyes. But there's so much going on in the background. You've got uh, this um, uh, sacrificial goat made of wood, which they decapitate. And then as they're, uh, you know, the, our, uh, our fellows are having a conversation in the foreground, in the background, they're taking the head and burying it. And that leads your eye over to someone is, is mixing something with a mortar and pestle. A gentleman is having a conversation with himself very animatedly, which I completely. Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you do know, that. That's why I, I do my <laughs> There's so many things going from left to right. Mark then goes, excuses himself to go urinate on the ancestral tree, <laughs> you know, and it's just like they're, they're oh, so, Mark. They're so, oh, Mark. Oh, we'll get we'll get to Mark. But there's so many tiny little bits that are that then connect in this incredible tapestry because they're all related to what is happening and what is about to happen. Mm -hmm. And then like, it gets to the point where my head just explodes and I'm like, Oh, fucking Ari Aster. I can't. It's too much. <laughs> you know? I know. I know. I know. I just want to shake him sometimes and then give him a hug and be like, are you yeah. okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very, very much so. And, and then just like express mail him to a therapist. <laughs> yes. well, this, this or this <laughs> Or, or, don't. Or, or yeah, or don't. <laughs> I mean, or don't, and then we get Bo is afraid. But that's yeah, a whole yeah, other that's podcast. A whole other, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I love that movie, honestly. But it is insane. But to, it is. To, it to, is. to be to be fair, so I know Midsummer was, I, I guess, somewhat therapeutic for Ari Aster because a, so uh, the success of Hereditary A twenty four asked him to write a folk tale horror and he happened to be going through a breakup at the time so that's how we got the uh the breakup uh portion of the story with this whole bigger you know folktale um folktale horror element uh like blended together and it was so seamlessly done i think in my opinion, it, it just, it worked so well for, um, even the transition of the environments, like how weird and awkward the couple were, even in the beginning in their homeland, they mm. were they you know, and then put them in a spot where they were both in a weird and awkward position in a play, in an unfamiliar zone. And they just continued to be weird and awkward. <laughs> like, it's just yeah. like, that was like the, like, even though you knew that they were going somewhere that was very, very unfamiliar, like they just started off being unfamiliar and it just, it, it carried it through really, really well. And 
I don't know. The ending is, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> I hope that he worked through some stuff. I mean, I really do because he put it all up there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there was – around the release of this movie, he did – he did a Reddit AMA and this was like screenshotted and passed around, of course. And one of the questions in the AMA was just, you okay, Aww. man? And Ari Aster's reply was just, nope. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but at least he knows, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm t- now I'm worried. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Find Ari, give him a hug. <laughs> it's... It's apparent that we're chomping to get at Midsommar and unpack it more. Let's just – let's spend five minutes on Wicker Man. Let's just wrap that yeah, one Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's up. fine. That's Absolutely. fine. Absolutely. I love it. I truly feel like it's the seed. I don't know that I, – I honestly don't know if Ari Aster was like, hey, OK, let me let me take uh, you know this concept and see what I can do with it. I, I, I just think it's inherent in good folk horror movies that you just have – you have the intrusion of uh, an unknown world with a character that usually thinks that they know everything, even if, even if they're not like, you know, like a blowhard, like, uh, you know, officer, uh, Howie, but it's usually someone who is just so, you know, just so obtuse as to actually what's actually going on. And that is just the wicker man to a T, but the playfulness of that movie, especially in comparison to, to Midsommar, it's a, it's a musical. <laughs> I mean, it literally is a yes. musical. And they, I actually made a joke about that in the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, don't watch this if you are one of those people who hates musicals. I guess yeah. <laughs> it has <laughs> such a sense for 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 what eventually happens and what it has become such an iconic horror movie for. It has such a sense of playfulness and such a sense of mischief, mm-hmm. and that you it, it's almost like a you know I mean Emily you'll. Y- y- your response to this is like a cat playing with its food with a mouse, you know? Oh, oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I, I always think of every – I've watched The Wicker Man like five times over the last year for book reasons and then just because I love it. Um, I always think of the logistics, that, like the town meetings that must have been going on behind the scenes in The Wicker Man to be like, okay, guys, you, you, you really got to be committed to this. All right, we need to get him over here. And like, Willow, you're going to try and come on to him and do your like your horny spell dance. Yeah. And you're going to sing the whole song. You're not just going to do a verse. The you're going to do the whole, whole song. song. <laughs> <laughs> and uh no, I think I actually, I actually also think I described I described uh, Howie to a friend who I was about to show this movie to um, as a man who can't hang so hard he dies. <laughs> Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. <laughs> He literally, and I know there are people who are like Howie is the hero of this movie, and I'm like. There, boy, there are two types of people, Yikes. or there's two versions of this movie, and I saw one and you saw it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. See that. An interesting topic, actually, for – and we'll go – we'll probably get into both of them, but I think it's more so prominent in The Wicker Man is there the good versus evil, right? That That's usually have that mm-hmm. pretty set forth just about in every – um, you know, action, horror movie that, you know, if you will. This one is very, very unclear. Cause like I said, both have a sense of entitlement. Um, you know, Sergeant Howie comes in thinking his way is correct. He's a Puritan. He's, um, you know, he served, he serves the country as you, as you know, we said, um, he, you know, he, is going in and restoring everything and everything to him. He's appalled by the school. Um, he may, he could, he, you know, and, but everyone he talks to, even though there could be like a little like poking fun and, you know, whatever. And obviously everyone's making fun of him the whole time. It's it, it. I'm trying to think of how to say it properly, but like they, they also are very free explaining everything and they don't really lie honestly about anything they maybe withhold the truth a little bit but especially the the teacher they um, use his repression against mm-hmm. him yes because he can't connect the dots yeah. he literally can't yeah he's too repressed all he would have had to do would be to sleep with Britt eklund <laughs> and, he's not and he would have survived yeah, he's not the movie the anymore you're absolutely right yeah all right emily I, I i just i have to say this because you've you, I've, I've, I'm having a light bulb moment. You ready for? It? Okay, we get Christopher Guest. I'm ready. It's like a waiting for Guffman, except it's it's 
all the people of Summer Isle behind the scenes, just like you said, <laughs> and they're all having these meetings, <laughs> and they're all trying to they're making masks, and it's not turning out with Christopher Guest. Somebody's make this project movie. managing. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> All right. We're, we're going to cobble together a very meager budget of $38, $39, and we'll approach Chris Rickast and see if we can get this off the ground. But that would be a funny yep, movie. I'll, I'll, go through the, I'll go through the couch cushion, see what I can contribute. <laughs> we're in. I'm going to form the LLC. Perfect. We're in. All right. I might have some schmeckles <laughs> hidden somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just let's just talk about the big reveal. I mean, you know, as sinners, we say this every episode. Spoiler alert for movies that are decades old, and we know who our listener base is. So you've seen this movie a dozen times, but we have to say it. So when we get to the end, and we have you know the immolation of Sergeant Howie in that beautifully constructed Wicker Man. I mean, it's just gorgeous. I just I, I absolutely love the you know, and these these were times where we had some practical effects but no cgi i mean these were carpenters and they were getting at it and they were building all this stuff and then burning it down but just that moment where he comes over the rise and he sees what's about to happen to him and then he's oh, he, so good. Oh, oh christ oh jesus oh god you know and it, all of a sudden it drops on him like literally like a house and he gets it and of course it's too late and to be you know like just the just the humiliation of having been played and especially having been played by not only all of Summer Isle, but really by a child, you know, because you have Rowan yeah. is really the the hook that sets to draw him through mm -hmm. all of the, you know, all of the places that he goes to and eventually through the cave and up the rise. And then he sees the Wicker Man. And then, you know, we you know, we do have lighthearted moments and the songs and all of that combined and it's been it hasn't been devastating until now and then mm -hmm. just to have <laughs> you know the wicker man lit and then everything kind of and they're singing and dancing and i can't help but think of that ending that last 10 minutes through almost damn near the entire runtime of of midsummer when i'm watching it you know, because mm -hmm. you know, after watching it one time, you're like, okay, you know what's what's going to happen. But it's just like, you know, you're leading up to that moment. There aren't really, there are no songs. Well, I should take that back. There are definitely songs, but there's not really that lighthearted element to Midsummer. But there is humor. You know, there is oh, humor. Yeah. Yes. And now I think we need to. We need to talk about Mark, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> he really is a fool. At Will Poulter, Will Poulter, man, he is so good in that role. And that role could have been played by so many people in so many different ways. But Will Poulter, he's got that face mm -hmm. and he's got that attitude. He's got that like sort of snotty, horny, mm -hmm. like... It, it, also the fact that he's like somewhat pathetic in how worried he is about like bugs and ticks and all that like he's, he's a lot. just he's, he's a, lot. a lot he's a lot <laughs> yeah he's a lot and he's hilarious oh my god he's so funny <laughs> in a way that he real that character didn't really need to be but like you i mean astro works so hard to make sure you really dislike all of these men like christian is obviously a fucking coward oh, yeah. and a terrible boyfriend oh yeah josh is like so blinkered by his academic studies that he can't see the danger that he's in even as he knows like what these rights are like he knows what i think it's the at 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 a stupa the with the the older people yeah. dying he knows what's coming he's like oh oh it's gonna be a real one oh okay but he doesn't think to warn no. danny who is six months out from having lost her parents right? horribly right so we have no sympathy for him <laughs> we have a little sympathy for him being like the black character in this white supremacist cult who's about to get murdered yeah. horribly of course but yeah. just like as a human being we're like oh come on man you couldn't be a little nicer and like Pella is supposed to be the like the nice one. He's the one that sees Danny, right? He's the one who wishes her a happy birthday and reminds her boyfriend to wish her a happy birthday. But of course, we know there's an ulterior motive, yeah. right? He wants her yep. to be the new May Queen to come and give them a whole bunch of like white babies, yeah. you know? Yeah. And and she is like very clearly being manipulated in the same way that Howie is being manipulated in the Wicker Man, but she's more purely a victim. 
Right. Agreed. Than Howie yeah. is. Because Howie agree. is like, Howie has agency and Danny doesn't really. She's just kind of along for the ride. Yeah. She doesn't know where she belongs, yeah. especially when she loses her whole family. She lost all of all of her sense of where she belongs. And the only person she mm-hmm. has is Christian. Um, yeah. Who was indifferent to her before. <laughs> He's literally worse than and nothing. Then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Emily, you brought up a great point though. I definitely want, I want to unpack this now because you know, people see this film and their reaction is, well, Danny lost the family and now she's gained this family at the end. So there's a triumph in that. And I'm always like, well, no, no, no. This family is a bunch of white nationalists, <laughs> white supremacists. No, this is no bueno. <laughs> you know? I know. That, right. that, that, does, that definitely but raises I, another question. If Because uh, people are like, oh, yeah, she was saved at the end. Yeah, because now she gained a whole new family. But it's like, but what was she saved? Like, what? What? what and it was none of it was her, I, her I conscious choice, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's kind of the brilliance of it is he manages to – maintain both of those threads throughout Mm -hmm. the movie which is that she needs and deserves a family a place that makes her feel safe a a place that recognizes her and sees her pain and her suffering and her uniqueness but they are very much a white supremacist cult is the thing and and that's actually a great metaphor for how groups like that you know, entice new members. They don't start out with like the white supremacist shit. They're more like, this is a space where you're welcome and you're seen and you're, you know, embraced. Drink this tea. (laughs) Right. It's fine. It's totally fine. You should definitely trust us. Yeah. You know, you, you you came for a, you know, a little uh, anthropological vacation. And the next thing you know, you're strung up uh, with your lungs out in a barn, you know. I mean, it's tra- Blood Eagle Man. Oh. Hell yeah! By the way, uh, are you a fan of Hannibal so cool. by any chance? I could not be more of a fan I'm of back. Hannibal. Oh my god, I have watched it like four times. <laughs> I mean, that episode with the Blood Eagle. Oh, I got to rewatch it. I'm sorry, sidebar sinners. I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> I had to bring it up. Sean had some tea. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> Maybe have some more later. Yeah. But we're living dangerously. I see. I do love that that you brought that up because I feel like a, a lot of people avoid that. A lot of people get a little uncomfortable about mm-hmm. talking about that, you know, that white supremacy aspect of the movie in particular. They kind of, you know, it's making everybody uncomfortable, so they don't bring it up. But it's very apparent, you know. Uh, Danny is yeah. not saved at the end of the movie. I, I, I still <laughs> worry for her greatly you know uh once the once we have that final frame and the screen goes goes dark you know i i really it's gonna sound horrible but i really don't care at all for the gentlemen you know they were all fairly horrible (laughs) all of them you know and they they just marched right into their doom blindly you know with Mm -hmm. very much by putting the blinders on on themselves but danny was just strung along i mean she's she literally had no she really didn't have any agency in what was happening and she literally wanted to leave you know and they manipulated Pele and manipulates her to stay and it just breaks my heart you know it just really does break my heart at the end of the film because uh you know she was just so she was so vulnerable from the beginning and i feel like Nothing has changed by the end. And now she's being, you know, Mm -hmm. she's just going to be manipulated by these people. And already has, to be honest. Can I, do you, do you guys recall the comic of the, I always forget the name of it. So forgive me for that. But the the dog that's literally sitting on fire and it's like, this is fine. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is fine. That is how I see Danny. It's like, and it's like, so it's like, there's a literal fire that she's staring at. Granted, she's not in it. um, But I think metaphorically she is you know yeah. like, i think there i think there are some echoes of carrie in this movie too where she's a woman who has just been so treated so badly and experienced such tragedies because with carrie when you go back and watch it right there are people reaching out to her who are like hey like we want to help you. And like, things just go so wrong. Like she's not purely a villain and she's not purely a victim. Right. And there are ways that she could have been redeemed. Like the movie didn't have to end Mm -hmm. like it does. And with 
Midsummer, it's kind of the same where like there are moments where Danny could have, you know, if she had decided not to go with them because her horrible fucking, I, I hate as a character, it's just, I hate him more than almost anyone in cinema. <laughs> um, Christian, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. No, uh, I'm just yeah, like, he's just fair. so like any woman who has ever dated a man like that. And, uh, you know, I, I reacted very strongly to that character for a reason. I'll say that. <laughs> um, but the, you know, all of the near misses where she could have like not gotten sucked into this are like tragic when you go back yeah. and rewatch, yeah. you know, she, it didn't have to end this way. Right. Yeah. 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 No, it is. It, it, it's so devastating. But I mean, that, look, that's that's the mark of a good movie. You, you know, you leave the theater and you're just like, I don't think I can talk for a bit. You know, it's you it, it eventually it. turns into the kind of movie. Yeah, it, it turns into the kind of movie where you could go to the diner and split a piece of pie and, uh, you know, talk about it, but not right away. <laughs> you know, it's the kind no. of movie that needs to, to settle in. And I love those. I just, oh, that's my wheelhouse right there. The ones that truly devastate me. (laughs) (laughs) The ones that really take your heart, grab it, and then just rip it right out. (laughs) Yeah. What's wrong with this? Enough for you you to look at it and just... Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I got to go put my brain in rice. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to steal that one. I steal so much from you, Absolutely. but I'm now going to steal that as well. <laughs> it's all freely given. Thank you. Thank you. So I let me ask the two of you, because there's been a resurgence in full car, you know, the past couple of years. Um, I jotted down a couple that came to mind. And so just off off the top of my head, I had um, – uh, Oh my gosh. Uh, Alex Garland's men came out. Uh, Mm -hmm. Annie's men came out as well. I mean, we have the witch or as Shannon and I like to call it the bitch. The the bitch. Lamb. Oh, one. That's how it's pronounced. That's that's right. It's the bitch. (laughs) All right. Well, I have a couple more that I want to bring up, but this one is special to me because this one really, this one resonated with me. How about kill list? Ben Wheatley's kill list. Have you guys seen it? For God. I have not seen it. I've heard amazing I things. I forgot all about that movie. It is. It it's something. It's it's something. You know. It's um. It's very good. It's very good. And it's very well made. And it is really. I mean, as far as full car goes, boy oh boy, this this ticks a lot of boxes. Um, very similar. Very very similar to um the Wicker Man. As I don't want to spoil anything. So you know what? For once in my life, I'm going to shut my dumb mouth. <laughs> nope. So. <laughs> <laughs> then we had one I hadn't seen, which is in the earth. Um, mm-hmm. I saw the feast. Shannon just saw the wailing. I adore the wailing. Um, I think that's very folk horror as well. We're yeah. we're actually going to do that, oh, yeah. Shannon. So I'm interested because I think we're going to have slightly different takes, but I'm interested for that. I think one so. that I really am dying to see called "You Won't Be Alone" with uh, uh, Nomi Rapace. Have you guys seen it? Yeah, I. I have not seen it, but it's, I literally, I think, just added it to my watch list like three days ago. Okay. All right. So uh, Apostle, which was on Netflix a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. that was mm-hmm. interesting as well. And then, of course, Hereditary. But I'm loving the fact that we're getting more folk horror because, let's be honest, I mean, I can't think of really anything – anything in the 80s 90s 2000s i know they're out there but they don't spring to mind you know we kind of had a drought there 70s boy oh boy we were we were on fire but it seemed like there was a little bit of a little bit of dip in the folk car and now it's back and i kind of want to keep it going so i'm excited for this moment that we're having yeah i think there's a i think there's a a cyclical aspect to this Mm. with other things that are i mean as as with so many types of horror i mean they're pretty much all responses to things that are going on in the real world and with folk horror you know as i was saying like that sort of origin story of the you know back to the land hippie communes all that i think what we're seeing now is is this sort of like oh god we're also inundated with technology and our jobs and everything oh i just oh i would love to just quit my job and go live in the woods you know that sort of canard that you hear let's go let's go back to the earth get away from the screens um yeah. reconnect yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and also just like i think we're all 
it, 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 maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, but you know, we're all in this sort of like, oh God, that's you know, people, people are the problem. Oh, I'm around so many people, like I oh, it's politics and social, you know, issues and COVID and all that is like sort of like, no, I want to go off by myself in nature and it's really important to me to connect with nature and oh right, there's evil here too. <laughs> I think uh, I think another trend nature of that- wants to kill you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think another trend of that too that was a little more prominent in recent years was um, everyone just looks at the world now and uh, it basically just think you know there's just a doom at the end and it's you know like well let me try to learn how to live off the land because we're gonna have an apocalypse in, in whatever way it is whether it's zombies whether it's um, aliens you know whatever it, it whatever what have you there is people who are convinced and have chosen to go back um, and just live off the land and just be be ready. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I mean, well, like that's the thing. You get the two types of people, right? They're the sort of like more hippie leftist crunchy. And then there's like the survivalist prepper right wing, like – people who are like, ah, the race war is coming or whatever. And that very directly ties into Midsummer mm-hmm. too, I think. He's like, I'm going to explore the other side right. of this. Because mm-hmm. Ari Aster is a Jewish director and he's been pretty forthright about the fact that like the Harga community in Midsummer is explicitly a white supremacist cult. I mean, like there's even a book on the coffee table early in the movie where this it's like the Nazi language of so-and-so, you know, ethnic group in Sweden. Um and all of the like runic symbols like and there's that whole white Mm -hmm. yeah and there's that white supremacist sort of people who study these like you know fringe racist groups are you know talk a lot about about how they have these imagined pasts that they want to go back to that never really existed yeah so this is kind of what that is it's like you know, nobody ever performed like the blood eagle or the the sort of suicide ritual you see in the movie. But like white supremacists love to sort of point back to that as like, oh, this is our heritage, and it's like a completely invented past that they're mm-hmm. talking about. It's cosplay, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> very, very well put. Very well put. Yeah. So, Emily, I'd be remiss if if I didn't ask you, you know, because of who you are, what folk horror novels. Could you recommend to our listeners? I know. Sorry to put you on the spot. But- well, the first one that comes to mind is Loot by Jennifer Thorne. Um, this came out a year or two ago from Nightfire. And it is, it's a very similar setup to The Wicker Man, you know, outsider on an island off the British Isles, very insular community. Um, but she's the wife of the sort of lord of the island. Okay. And she's kind of starting to integrate herself into the community. And then, oh, the, you know, once every however many years ritual starts and she's, you know, jolted from her comfortable life uh, with a, a whole lot of deaths. Um, <laughs> Ooh, I'm writing this down. Oh, so <laughs> Adam, <laughs> Adam Neville. Oh, absolutely. Um, I can also send over a, a list if you guys want to like put stuff in the show notes. Oh, afterwards. We always want a list. Thank you. We always want a list. Great. <laughs> I, like I want to you know get up in the morning. I want to check the weather. I want to see, you know, maybe maybe the sports, the news, and a book list. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. <laughs> so there's uh, all of Adam Neville's books. Really, are great folk horror. Um, the Ritual is the one that comes to mind. It's the one that got that Netflix adaptation that some years ago. Is great that movie. based right great off movie. of David Spinner's The Ritual? That is it. No, I think it's I think it's completely okay, because its own I know thing. that was um, supposedly that was what the Wicker Man was based off of was that novel. Yes, yes. Um, even though very yeah. very loosely, like it goes, you know, like the, yeah, loosely. the Wicker Man definitely goes mm-hmm, where yeah. It's- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's a great sort of. Appalachian folk horror novel that's coming out later this year uh, called The Unmothers Ooh. by Leslie I've J. Anderson. It's really good. Oh my God. It's um, it's about a journalist who goes to investigate sort of a, a fluffy, you know, 
not a, like a serious story, but she's just gone through a personal tragedy and her editor's like, go to this town where there's like some tabloid rumor that a horse gave birth to a human baby. And of course, what she finds is a town where like, you know, the opioid crisis, the opiate crisis has really like taken hold and they're, you know, they're struggling economically okay. and people who, you know, women in this town who get pregnant, um, if they don't want to be pregnant, they have a certain recourse uh, via the thing in the woods. Okay. And that's all I'm going to say about it. It's a fucking brilliant book. Oh, it's brilliant. Um, it's, uh, oh my God, there's so many, so many more that I'm just, n that aren't coming to mind now, but I will, I will put together a list for you guys after the, Hooray. after this. <laughs> Beyond Mothers Alone, this, please, that's fantastic that you yeah, recommended. I'm super uh, excited about that. And I'm going to get lit yeah. as well. That's great. All right. So, Shannon, we've got to get to our questions. I know. We've got to get to our three <laughs> questions for Emily. Do you want to do the first one? You want me to do the first one? Um. Yeah, you, you do the first one. Okay. I can't remember yeah. the order, so I'm going to do the first one that pops in my head. So, this, all right, Emily. This, you've got to defend a movie. Oh, sorry. Scariest movie experience. We'll yeah. see. Sorry, you explain it better. So, this can be – this can be an actual movie – or it can be just an experience that you've had. It doesn't necessarily need to be cinematic. So what's the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? Or scariest thing you've ever seen? I have to say Event Horizon. <gasps> okay. I have to say watching the movie Event Horizon on my roommate's bed in like, I don't know, 2008 or 2009 or something like that. And I, at that point, was still very much like, oh, I can't do horror movies. I'm too much of a weenie. <laughs> um, and I didn't really know what I was getting into. She's like, oh, it's like a sci-fi. It's like a scary sci-fi movie. And I was like, great. I love sci-fi. It. It'll be fine. <laughs> and then we were with my like my then boyfriend and the three of us sh smoked a joint. And that was a terrible <laughs> idea. Everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I mean, now I'm at a point where I love watching horror movies stoned, but I just, at the time I was like, I did not have the basis to like watch that movie and be okay afterwards because it was so intense and so fucked up. Yeah. And now of course it's one of my favorite movies, but the first time I saw it, I, it really like, oh, I couldn't, I, I, I had trouble kind of like bringing my heart rate down afterwards. Yeah, you can't come down, you know, yeah. it just keeps you up there mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, uh, Maybe we'll put on, I don't know, you know some it's, animation. Not Watership Down. Right. That's a really good idea. No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> you want to feel worse? I, that's a great, yeah, that's a great, great scary experience. Love it. Okay. The second one, I'll let you do the third one, Shannon. So the, I already spoiled the second one. So the second one is um, a movie that everyone thinks is kind of garbage that you'll go to bat for, that you'll defend and you love. So you actually mentioned it earlier, um, and it's Men by Alex Garland. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I, you know, that thing where you're like, I, I understand why people don't like this, but it just, everything about it works for me. Everything about Alex Garland's whole thing, everything he has ever made pretty much works for me. And I'm like, fuck, I'm going to see Civil War. I don't know why you made this movie, but I'm going to see it. But I did finally watch Men uh, last summer, and it's an insane movie. It's a completely insane movie, right? Like, Rory Kinnear is every man, yeah. and he's just, like, menacing and nude and, like, always a red. Insane movie. Completely unhinged but I love it. I love it. And I understand why people were like, what is this? But I, everything about it is like tailor made for me. We'll have to explore that further uh, because I want to like that movie. Cause I, I like the way it was done, but the whole, like the, the, the whole regurgitation thing was like, I, I'm still trying to unpack that I think. And I, it might've gone over my head a little bit um, where I think it went over yeah. everybody's head. It certainly went over mine, but I just liked it anyway. <laughs> like, I'm still oh, mad that yeah. I'm, like, not part of it. Like, what was that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. But that's a me problem. That's okay. I also, I, I, I have to 
say that, you know, when, as we were watching it, the thing I, I turned to my husband yeah. and said was, oh, this is movie. This is a movie about the the universal horror that we all experience of when Rory Kinnear is getting closer and closer to you. <laughs> Rory Kinnear. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I just got a cramp. Oh. I'll see myself out. I'll, I'll kick myself out of the recording now. <laughs> no, Emily, you just came up with the title for this episode. <laughs> Emily, you getting Rory Kinnearer. That's it. You've already helped. That sounds like a whole other book that needs to be written. <laughs> Could be in a whole other yes. podcast. <laughs> All right, Shannon, you got the you got the third question. What do we got? All right. So what is your best and or worst book to film adaptation? Uh, one that you love uh, and one that you hate um, or which, are, you know, so you can have two answers. Okay. I think the question <clears throat> I got via email was what movie would you want to see? Oh, remade? Is that the original? Do you want to stick oh, with the original? That was question? the original. Yeah. Oh, Okay. Okay, I can do. I can do either one. I can no, do. Do the, do the one I sent you. Let's do that one first because I know you prepared something, right? I'm oh, curious okay. to see yeah, what, okay. you, yes. what you said. Okay, so then, so what movie uh, you want to see remade is the question. So this is kind of an insane. I, like I'm, I'm sixty percent serious on this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ghost Ship two thousand two. Nice. Oh, I'm, I'm with you. I'm nice. with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, it is not a good movie. It does have that amazing opening sequence with the, you know, the, the wire. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a whole movie. I often turn it off right after that. But if but if you oh, can yeah. remake but it and make the rest of there, it better, though. there's something there. I, I I had a my insane suggestion for director and star would be a remake of Ghost Ship by Julia DeCorno, who made Titan a couple years ago. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. I love it so and much. And starring Tilda Swinton. Love it. <laughs> I right. love it. Yeah. I don't – now – see, this is the problem with that question. Now in my mind, I'm like, I can't wait till that movie comes out. And now, of course, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Well, someone can give me a lot of money and I'll Let's, do my we best. We have to get our schmeckles together, Sean, and then we'll yeah. figure that out. A Sinful Cuts production. Could you imagine? <laughs> right? There would – in the history of poorly run production companies, <laughs> we would be the worst. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have some competition. I People don't know. People start podcasts about us. <laughs> oh my – do we want that? <laughs> Look – I got more skeletons in this on. closet than a graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty crazy. <laughs> now that's full circle. That is full circle. <laughs> Thank you so much for the three questions. Now, Emily, this is this. The end of our podcast is all yours. Tell us what you have coming up. Let's definitely talk more about um, uh, uh, horror for weenies. And then let us know what else is what exciting stuff you have coming up. I mean, at this point, I'm in the, the the cycle of book publishing is is such that, you know, you write a book and you go through edits and you go through copy edits and you go through like proofs and all that. And then you're done and you just wait. So I'm in the waiting right now. Um, the book comes out September 3rd. I imagine, I mean, you, this is technically the first podcast that I'm doing like you know, to promote the book, uh, which is, which is really fun and really exciting. And, uh, um, I think let's see. Yeah. We'll start doing like publicity and marketing stuff in earnest probably in a few months. But at this point, I'm just trying to like figure out what my, you know, I'm, I'm sort of mapping out my own like promotional calendar, um, you know, podcasts I want to reach out to or, yeah. or, you know, events I want to do or like, because it's a, a book about movies, I'm sort of like, oh, can I do a screening series? Oh, there are permissions issues, except for Night of the Living Dead. I can do that one anytime because yeah. it's you, not yeah, in yes, copyright. You can. <laughs> <laughs> it's public domain, baby. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, and, and just picking away at some fiction of my own. Um, this is a, uh, this book I'm, I'm, it was so much fun to write and it kind of fell into my lap about a year ago. Uh, 
the editor, my wonderful editor, Jess Zimmerman, um, is herself a professed weenie <laughs> and a reader of Wikipedia plot synopses. And it was like, oh, you know, I just really think that there should be a book about this for people who really want to know what's going on and talk to their friends about horror movies, but just can't bear to watch them. And I was like, I have... I have a lot of thoughts about that. And now there's a book. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I'm working on. I'm hoping to be at a couple cons this summer. I'm going to be at reader con in Boston in July. Uh, I can't go to Stoker con this year, which oh. I'm, I'm devastated about because I have a, f- a friend's wedding. Um, and then, yeah, it's just going to be sort of run up to the book. I'm, I'm just in the in the calm before the storm. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely we'll, keep talking about it for sure. We're going to promote <clears throat> our you. for weenies because, look, you know I'm stealing from you weekly for the shortcuts episode. So we will absolutely promote the book every <laughs> yes. single week. It's the, le- it's the least you can do, Sean. <laughs> and then into infinity. Then we'll talk about it forever. But please, Emily – um. Email me where what uh, conventions you're going to be at, and we'll point people in your direction. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. we're just going to shout That's your great. name from the yeah. hilltop. I promise you, because we couldn't be more thankful for what you do and for coming on. And you know, in my mind, I was like, I don't know, we're going to be best friends. And now, yeah, we. I mean, we're best friends now, so it all worked out <laughs> great for me. Did we just become best friends? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Now, you know, we, we're going to have you back. I don't want to spoil anything, but we're going to have you back in a couple of months and we'll talk about more exciting things then. But for coming on today, we just absolutely couldn't be more thankful. Yes. I am so, so glad to be here. I, I've been listening to a lot of uh, your episodes in the lead up to this since since you reached out around New Year's, Sean. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's just been like, oh, these are my friends already, right? You know, in that way that you you listen to a podcast and you're like, yes, I know these people. And it's like, no, Emily, stop, stop. Don't do that. Don't, don't scare people. Um, but I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. And I can't wait to come back and talk about Redacted uh, several months down the line. You got it. You can't wait to have you back for Redacted. <laughs> <laughs> what's great about that is that i actually completely forgot what it was so i'm, I'm really really redacted <laughs> i'm like I'm, I'm trying to remember and i'm like i don't remember right now but that's <laughs> we'll be discussing. it'll be a fun surprise for all of us i should say we'll be discussing and then i just disconnect the podcast <laughs> i'm just gonna go have some tea it's fine it's okay Thank you so much for coming on, Emily. Thank you. (laughs) You are so welcome. Thank you, guys. Take care. And that's a cut.